I'm one of our department's anthropological archaeologists. And what that means is I am interested in asking big anthropological questions, but trying to answer them through the things that people left behind, right? The stuff that is in the archaeological record. Often that's just people's trash. And the kinds of questions that I'm really interested in as an anthropologist is how people are impacted and affected when the political system that they live in changes and changes radically. And the ways in which people respond to that. And in archaeology, we've done quite a good job of thinking about that question. How are you impacted if your political system changes significantly? We've done a good job of asking that question in the context of the emergence and the spread of states and of empires. So one good example is the Roman Empire. And there's a lot of archaeological work that thinks about how local communities were impacted as the Roman Empire spread across parts of the Middle East and North Africa and into Europe. Archaeologists though have been slower to look at sort of the opposite situation and that's when those expansive political systems and empires fall apart or disintegrate and this is something that's often glossed as state collapse and we really don't have to look very far back in human history to see that this is a recurrent process, the breakdown of expansive political systems. So we could think about the end of the British Empire, we could think about the breakup of the Soviet Union, we can go back a bit further in time and think about the end of the Aztec Empire or we could go back to our Romans, right, and think about the fall of Imperial Rome. And when archaeologists have thought about these moments in the human past when expansive states or empires fell apart, what they've tended to do is focus on the elites, on the leaders of society, on urban centres, on capitals, on those kinds of things, which is important, but it leaves an awful lot of the picture missing. And those are those regular people in society, people who aren't elites, who aren't wealthy, who don't live in capital cities. So what if you're just a regular person living your life and the political system that you and generations before you have known falls apart? Does it affect you? If so, how? And if it affects you, what do you do about it? How do you respond to it? Archaeology is actually really well positioned to answer these kinds of questions. And that's because A, archaeology gives us an insight into everybody in the past. It doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter how much money you have, it doesn't matter what gender you identify as, it doesn't matter how old you are, we all leave a trace in the archaeological record. Um, all the people who aren't often considered in, important in written histories of the past are there in the archaeological record. So it's a very sort of democratic way of thinking about the past, of addressing these questions in the past. And the other thing that archaeology gives us is a really long time frame to work with. Um, we can really get at the long term impacts of things like state collapse. Um, so we can look at not just the immediate out aftermath of it, but how things played out over decades, over centuries, even over millennia. So to try and address these questions about the impacts of state collapse and how people are affected by and respond to these major changes in political systems, my work focuses on one case study in particular, and that case study is the Tiwanaku state. And Tiwanaku is one of the earliest expansive states in Andean South America. And the state emerged around about AD 4 or 500 um, in what is now Bolivia, but quite quickly began to expand across the region and to set up sort of colonial outposts in parts of what is now Chile, parts of what is now southern Peru. And that state continued and thrived for about 500 years. But what happens around about AD 1000 is the state begins a kind of process of gradual, but sometimes violent decline. And we're not entirely sure why this happened, um, but it seems to be that a combination of climatic stress, environmental changes, coupled with sort of infighting amongst those elite in society contributed. And the aftermath is quite violent. Um, this was not a pleasant process. Things like temples get torn down, wealthy um, tombs get raised to the ground and torn apart. Um, people then begin to abandon the cities and towns that they had lived in under this state for 500 years. They flee, right? They literally get out of these towns and they move to other parts of territories and there they establish much smaller communities. Um, I think one way of thinking about these is essentially as refugee settlements. These are small refugee settlements that over time become permanent villages. And so the work I do in trying to think about what's it like if you live through 
radical political change, if your state has fallen apart, has disintegrated, has collapsed. Um, the way we've tried to think about that is by conducting very intensive and ex extensive excavation and analysis of materials at some of these refugee villages that are established around about AD 1000. Archaeology is really fun, partly because it's totally a team sport. It's a really collaborative endeavour. So this project is huge. I think in the space of 15 years, it's involved maybe well over 100 people. And that includes professionals from Peru, professionals from Bolivia, uh, professionals from other US institutions, um, but also a number of students, including a lot of GSU undergraduates and graduate students. And those students come with us to Peru for extended periods during the summer, um, and they participate fully in the excavations and the analysis. They learn field methodology and analysis methodology, and they conduct their own independent research projects. So this kind of team effort um, has enabled us or facilitated us to ask a series of questions about the lived experience of state collapse. And so some of the things we've done, for instance, are we've excavated people's houses from this period, from about a thousand years ago. And that's facilitated us thinking about um, what community organisation looks like. If your state system has gone away, you no longer have that kind of state-based hierarchy with your wealthy people and your elites and so forth. What does it look like in a small community? Do you still have kind of hierarchy and social stratification? Or are things a bit more egalitarian? We've looked at things like um, the plants and the animals that people were consuming. Um, this is extensive analysis of things like animal bones, right? Consumptive practices. And that's important because it's given us an, an insight into the extent to which people's access to essentially a balanced diet was impacted by this, right? Did your access to the foods that you needed, did that change when this big political and violent turmoil happened? We've integrated a lot of new and emerging technologies around the analysis of material culture, of people's stuff, their pots and so forth, um, to think about the ways in which crafting changed in this period um, and how people's access to imported goods was affected. Do you still have the same trading partners? Um, what does your economic system look like at this point? Do you just have to rely entirely on really local resources or can you still build networks across long distances? A few years ago, we were really lucky and we came across a context at one of these sites that seems to be essentially a temple. It's a very rustic temple. It doesn't look very sort of impressive um, in many ways, but it's been a really interesting space to look at because we know that during the height of Tiwanaku authority, um, religious practice was very tightly interwoven with the political system, elites controlled religion. And what we found at one of these post collapse communities is people kind of take religion back, right? They sort of own it as theirs, despite the absence of elites. And we think it's being used kind of religious practice to build essentially solidarity and a collective kind of identity in the face of this sort of regional political turmoil and violence. We've looked at identity in other ways as well. We've excavated burials at one of these sites and that's enabled us to look at how people are redefining the identities that they think are important right when that big overarching state identity is perhaps impacted by political change who do people think they are right what are their important affiliations in that context one of our GSG grad students recently did her thesis analyzing some of the skeletal remains from those burials and that was really important work because she demonstrated that health declines in the context of state collapse, that um, this process of political change is literally inscribed into people's skeletons. Um, so we've done this very kind of comprehensive big picture look at the experience, the lived experience of state collapse on the ground for regular folk, those folk who wouldn't be in our written histories of the past, but the folk who really represent the sort of demographic majority of human societies. And for me, I kind of think about archaeology as kind of a laboratory that lets us ask and try to answer questions that are really important, not just in the past, but now in the present. State collapse is something that happens around the world today and that are important questions in the future as well. Something we need to be thinking about um, for the future of human societies. And so this kind of extensive work we've done in southern Peru, I think, gives us a quite mixed picture. 
and there are elements of it that to me are really bleak, right? Um, life definitely got tougher. Uh, people had more limited access to resources. We see them actually trying to kind of almost recycle or be really careful about how they use certain kinds of products. Um, we see that health is impacted. People get sicker over time. Um, but we also see, I think, a picture of kind of resilience, right? Of people strategically making choices about what they wanted to do as the world around them changed. And to me, that's actually a really hopeful kind of take home point from this work.